talking about, at least on Thursday, frequency response curves for first the uh, a linear oscillator and then a nonlinear oscillator. And we had done um, some computations of those curves and finding their shape and things of that sort. And now we're, um, then we got to the, the nonlinear case and we had sort of ended with the idea that because of uh, when you do a harmonic analysis, um, if you have say a, this should be a cubic up here, not, a, not that, this should be cubic. We analyzed this equation, which is a, it's a duffing with a stable origin. So it's a bit like this epsilon term is sort of like modifying a simple harmonic system. Uh, so you just have some, some nonlinear terms in there, like a nonlinear spring. And when you look at solutions, you assume solutions that have this form for this, this equation, at least when there was no damping. Um, when we add in damping, which we will add in damping, you could still do something of this form and you'll have, uh, for the cosine omega term, this was the cubic equation that you would solve for A1. And because it's a cubic, it opens up the possibility that there could be three independent roots. So you would take the determinant of this polynomial, just viewing it like a typical cubic polynomial. And for uh, certain ranges of omega, it will lead to uh, three roots, three positive roots. And then you would take that A1 term, then that's the leading term. That was like 95% of the uh, oscillation came from, uh, came from that. If you wanted to look at higher order corrections like the cosine three omega T term, you could use that A1, plug it in here to solve for A3 and so on. If you wanted to solve for A5, A7, uh, all the way up the chain. Um, I'm gonna make this less bright. Let's make my face look weird. Okay, and then I showed this picture below, which looks like a frequency response curve, but I'm showing this tilted, it, it becomes tilted, but it doesn't actually close off unless this closing off is because Q is finite. If you have Q not closing off, this becomes infinite, just like it does in the uh, linear case. So if we, if we look at um, no damping, and then let me bring in a, a curve. Yep. We get something like, like this, where this just goes off to infinity up here because it's, so this is Q goes to infinity. Um, Q going to infinity means an infinitely peaked curve, just like in the linear case. When we have uh, Q is finite, we'll get something different. And that is, um, let me show that also from the Hand and Finch book. I think these are two kind of nearby figures. So this is showing basically A1 as a function of omega. And I think this was the case of where we had like uh, the frequency of the oscillator was one. The input amplitude was one. Epsilon was something like 0.1. Well, these two curves are different values of Q. I think this is a Q of 10. Maybe this lower curve is a Q of five, something smaller than 10. So just like with the li linear case, uh, having a finite Q closes off that curve, even though it's now tilted um, and it makes it kind of smaller. So you have a larger, uh, a smaller effect due to resonance. And the, the book will go into more detail about where these formulas come from. Um, 
but I just wanted to give you an idea of what the what's a as a function of f not and omega for this nonlinear case. So for this for this nonlinear system, the frequency response uh, formula. Is approximately um, this. So this is over, and remember our driving frequency omega naught equals one. So this is this can be like an omega naught squared here, but we're just writing one minus omega squared. Um, now, if this was the linear case, we'd just square that, but this isn't the linear case. So there's there's an extra term, epsilon to the three fourths a one squared, squared. So, uh oh, a one's here and here. What's going on? Plus omega squared over q squared. So this is what we get. For epsilon equals zero, it's the same as the linear case. Except maybe for the linear case, instead of writing things in terms of Q, we wrote them in terms of beta. But you get this kind of curve. So um, we're showing this curve up above for uh, two different values of Q. And then you might be wondering, why are some regions dashed? Like, why did I dash this? And that's because that is, it's an unstable branch of periodic solutions. Meaning if you start near it at that frequency, um, the dynamics is going to push you away from it. So if you start below it, you'll be pushed down. If you start above it, you'll be pushed up and you'll go to the stable thing. So if I say, let's say I started at an amplitude up here. Well, the transient um, solution will die out and I will go to this closest stable solution. If I started down here, I would go up and I would end at this stable solution. So this dashed line, this unstable periodic orbit becomes a dividing line in the um, phase plane, just like shown here. It's a dividing line between a large amplitude stable and a small amplitude stable. And we'll go through how you determine stability because that's uh, kind of a nice calculation. All right. So, what do we got here? Okay. So how do we determine stability? For um, frequencies, these are driving frequencies. With multiple coexisting periodic orbits. When there's only one, like let's say we were here at a value of about 0.7. So if our driving frequency was 0.7, um, so we're along this line, well, there's only one stable solution. So no matter where we start, the transient will die out and will be our long-term steady state dynamics will be at that amplitude, whatever it is, um, something like 1.2, I don't know. Um, but when we've got more than one, like over here at omega is 1.5, well, you know, what? which one will we eventually settle down on? And that has to do with, are they all stable? Are some unstable? So we can figure out the stability. And the way that we do that, so this is also in that uh, Hand and Finch chapter 
10. So this is the stability of periodically driven solutions. I think it's in the book, it's page 410, and in Finch, it's in uh, chapter 10. What we do is we consider, um, maybe just make a little sketch here. Here's Q, uh, actually, no, I'll do Q up here, sorry. Here's Q, and here is uh time let's call this point uh where we are this is q at a particular time and let's say there is a at that same time there is a periodic solution so this is the periodic solution one of these three curves at like this one this one or this one it's a, one of those periodic solutions and then the, we'll look at our displacement. This displacement equals, we'll call that epsilon or no, chi. So we'll look at, we'll write Q as a function of time is, can always be written as a displacement from the nearest periodic orbit. So just to summarize that again, here's the periodic solution of interest the one that we were asking the question what is the stability of that periodically driven solution and then this chi as a function of time this is a small displacement so we could write any q as periodic solution plus small displacement chi all right so in this periodic solution we'll we'll write it the way we have been writing it We'll just now we're calling it Q naught. Q naught T is A1 cosine omega T plus A3 cosine 3 omega T plus if we wanted to go to higher harmonics we could but let's let's not and then we will plug this plug this into the ODE to the governing ODE. And just to make life easier, I'll initially look at the no damping case. So Q goes to infinity. So this would be Q double dot plus Q plus epsilon Q to the cubed equals F naught cosine omega T. All right, plug it in there and collect things. Q double dot Q naught double dot plus Q naught plus epsilon Q naught to the third plus chi double dot plus chi plus um, what do we get? Oh yeah, the next term here is three epsilon Q naught squared chi. That comes from this term, right? When you write Q naught plus chi cubed, you get some things. And the leading order term is this one. So plus higher order in chi, um, which we'll ignore. And then this all equals F naught cosine omega t. Okay. Let's group some things together. We already know that this part of the solution over here, the chi naughts, uh, equals this, that these two are satisfied. So if you want, this is satisfied uh, by Q naught. So the periodic part of the motion satisfies that. And then we're left with um, this middle purple part equaling nothing to, for, to, to leading order in chi. And this is also, this is, you know, leading order means we're considering small displacement.
So we're left with chi double dot plus chi plus three epsilon q naught squared chi equals zero. And then you go, oh, okay. This is actually, if I group terms here, let me group them. Chi double dot plus one plus three epsilon q naught squared chi. Oh, this is just, it's kind of first order in chi, but I know what q naught is, right? Q naught is a periodic function. Right, Q naught squared to leading order is A1 squared cosine squared omega t. So that's ignoring the A3, so the higher order harmonics, which I could write this as, this is A1, I'll just write cosine squared using a trig identity. It's one half one plus cosine two omega t. So then uh, let me just rewrite this ODE and it looks like this. Um, I've got uh, one plus three epsilon q naught squared equals one plus three epsilon a one squared over two plus three halves epsilon a one squared cosine two tau. Let me just kind of separate those. Uh, where I've defined tau tau is omega t. So why, did, why, why am I doing this? That's because I have something that now looks like, I can make this look like the math out equation. Let me just put that over here. The math out equation, I've got this thing that I'll call A, and then this thing, I'll, I'll define this as negative two Q. A is a constant. Q is a constant. So the ODE for chi um, is just the math out equation which now we've seen and what's nice about that it's already been calculated once and for all. You could look it up in a table or something or redo it. The regions of stability and instability, they're already mapped out for A and Q. They've been mapped out once and for all. Like once you can take your problem and turn it into something that's already solved, that's it's kind of a nice strategy. In uh, a Q space, parameter space are known. And I will just insert it here to remind us. Uh, there they be, there's a few of them. These are just the first few, right? They, they're, they're already known. So if you start then plugging in um, these combinations, uh, what is A1 squared for those different branches, then you could start classifying their stability. And so what happens for at least the problem that we've been looking at is that you get the stability the way that we've, the way that we've written it uh, so if we write a1 as a function of omega, uh, you'll get that the branch that kind of it goes to a, it becomes kind of vertical and that right at that point, this becomes dashed, becomes unstable. And then when it goes
vertical again, then you get stability. Maybe I'll make this axis a little bit longer. Okay, and what's happening at these two points, I guess I could, maybe I'll do my own little key, solid line equals stable and dashed equals unstable. Okay, you would get that just by plugging in, what are the values of A between, you know, here and here? That's what you get. Now these points where a stable and an unstable solution vanish, let's say as you're increasing frequency up, up here, those points are, uh, I think we talked about with this in one of the first few lectures. Those, it's called a bifurcation point and they're called saddle node bifurcations. So where the stable and unstable uh, branches meet is a saddle node bifurcation. And that picture that I drew before kind of shows what, what's going on here. If you have Q, Q dot, we've got a uh, large amplitude, let's say at, I don't know, along here. That's hard to see. Along this kind of orange line here, what's going on? You've got um, a large amplitude stable. Um, orbit. So stable means if I'm perturbed a little bit away, so I have a chi that's something small, then right, this is going to want to curve towards and onto my uh, periodic solution, whether I'm above or below it. That's what it means to be stable as a periodic solution. In between, there is some dashed unstable periodic orbit. Like, what do we mean by unstable periodic orbit? It means if you could technically start on there, you will actually do a loop, but trajectories that are a little bit off will want to move away. And they'll want to actually move away to a stable periodic solution. If you start a little bit below, you will move away. And what will you move away to? You'll move away to a another periodic solution. So things that will move away. So that's um, that's kind of the sketch of what the phase space looks like. So this is the green point in the middle and then we got this large amplitude and a small amplitude. Um, you might wonder well what's the origin doing? I think the, the origin is also unstable. So if you started near the origin you would be spiraling out to this small amplitude stable periodic orbit. Now, the phenomenon of uh, hysteresis is very much related to this plot. And I think you're able to explore that in, uh, it might be homework problem. Uh, it's one of the last ones. Uh, five. So homework problem five is asking you to look at the duffing system with some reasonable value of Q, like, Q equals 10. Don't do infinite Q or this won't work. So I came up during office hours. Um, and you'll need some proxy for what the amplitude is. A proxy for the amplitude would be, where do you hit the right-hand side of the Q axis? So what you'll tend to see is if you were to simulate, if you simulate some initial condition you'll see it kind of maybe do some kind of weird transient thing and then it settles down to what looks like a periodic trajectory like the lines will get really thick right there, which means okay you found something it's periodic so maybe integrate you do you do numerical integration of your ode for a long enough period of time keep the last bit and see where that crosses this axis and that'll be your amplitude whoa i didn't want to do that okay your, your amplitude. So the, the uh, phenomenon of, of hysteresis is that you've got, you've got a curve that looks kind of like that. 
And when you, let's say you start with um, some small uh, frequency. Well, just you simulate basically any initial condition, start with any initial condition and it'll after a short time get to that stable solution. Now you take that stable solution as the, uh, for your next initial guess of what the next solution will be. Then you simulate there and then you'll find that this goes to another point and you use that for the next guess. So you're, you're increasing omega. And what you'll see through this, pro it might not be exactly on that curve because that curve uh, made some approximations. Well, you're only following the upper branch, the larger amplitude periodic orbits. And then at some point, you'll do an, your next guess. And oh my goodness, that doesn't, it, it ends up going very, very far away. And it settles on a, law, a small amplitude periodic orbit. That's because the large amplitude periodic orbit disappeared in the saddle node bifurcation. Then if you did this again, well, it'll settle down on something very close. And so you get curves like that. So that's increasing omega. You get something like that. If you decrease omega, that means you're starting from small amplitude periodic orbits. And you keep kind of using that as the first guess. Well, you'll keep so you'll find something here, you'll guess that it, it's this, and then, oh, it finds that, you'll guess it's here, and it keeps finding this lower branch, the small amplitude periodic orbits, until at some point it reaches this other kind of critical point in omega. So we might call this point uh, omega critical one, and then this other one, omega critical two. Depending on whether you are increasing the, uh, the frequency or decreasing the frequency, you'll have different critical values of omega. You'll have different paths. And then you make a guess that, okay, I think it'll be here. Oh, no, it goes up to this, this larger branch again. In fact, it should find the exact same ones. And then you'll be stuck on this, the larger branch and it'll keep finding that. So this is what, this is hysteresis. Hysteresis is that if you've got omega decreasing versus increasing, you have different paths. There's different critical values. And this is seen in systems. Like there's a lot of uh, molecular biology systems that depend on hysteresis to get things right. Uh, but you could, you'll, you could also see this in mechanical systems. This is where it was first seen. Duffing was uh, studying this 100 years ago. Um, you might wonder like how tilted can these resonance frequency curves get? I saw a talk, so I don't know much about it, honestly. But I did see a talk where they were looking at some case and maybe it has to do with specifics of the non-linearity, but like for one value of frequency of uh, the parameters, they had something like that. At the next value, this, it's kind of like that thing's, the upper tip split off and you have this isolated region. It's pretty weird. And I think half of this is unstable and the other half stable. So it's like, uh, um, if we were to be more careful about that, we'd have like a region of stable and unstable points. Um, this thing that's isolated, they called it an isola, and I honestly don't know anything about it, but I thought it was kind of cool. It looks like a little drop breaking off, but it's some kind of isolated region of periodic and periodic orbits. All right. I have a question. Okay. How do you find the amplitude for the periodic uh, orbit from the numerical simulation? So you need, this would be um, like for that homework problem five, what you would plot here, I'm calling it A1, but you could just define it as the steady state solution where it intersects your Q axis, the positive Q axis. And you could just define that as A1. Cause it's, I mean, that's a good ap approximation of the amplitude of the orbit is where, does your 
trajectory as it's going around, where does it intersect the positive Q axis? So you, do, you would do a simulation, um, wait for a long enough period of time for the transient to die out. And you know that's, I don't know how long that'll take. Um, and then record that um, location. So that's the, that would be the value along, let's call it the x-axis, where your solution crosses the positive x-axis. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. All right. Oh, and I so it's not going to, it's not going to exactly match the kind of theoretical curve because that had approximations to it. But yeah, there was another question. Oh, so uh, it is, um, so is it difficult to like somewhat predict uh, how long it will take for you to convert to a stability? So like eigenvalue, like how large is it? Um, um, yeah, so it actually has to do with the the trace of the m matrix that you get from the Matthau equation. Um, so something like very deep within these instability regions, it's the least stable. So things will move away quickly. As you get closer to the boundary, it'll you know, become more. So that has to do with the the trace of m and the eigenvalues of of, of m. I think to a good approximation, like we had before, the transient. Um, the transient solution kind of went as e to the negative beta t and what you know beta is what is it one over two q something like that so that gives you some time scale uh but you could it's mostly you know at least for that problem it's just based on looking at it you wait a long enough time, you'll be on that steady state solution. And it should be pretty quick. We're not, I mean, the, the duffing system we're looking at isn't too exotic. Um, for some general system you might have in mind, I don't, I don't know. Um, but hopefully that, that helps. There, there is a way to quantify how long it takes. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, are there any other questions about this? Otherwise, I was going to move to the another related topic. Maybe I should put on here what I've been saying. Hysteresis. I don't even know how to spell it. Yeah, I don't know how to spell it. Got a bunch of E's. There we go. Okay, so we've been talking about some analytical ways to study a time periodic system. We did introduce before some non-analytical ways. Uh, and so I want to, want to return to that. This is the geometric view that we've talked about before. So this is back to the geometric view in extended phase space. So extended phase space just means that we include time essentially, but we it's cyclic time. So if you've got x dot is f of x and t, where x could be n-dimensional. We'll, we'll only talk about two-dimensional later, but and f is periodic in time, which means uh, the vector field repeats, and we drew that picture before. some period T, capital T. We can also write it in terms of uh, frequency, omega. We can define the uh, phase, because we have this periodicity that makes life easier for us to analyze, we can define the phase variable. 
This isn't what gives rise to the word face space though. So don't get confused there. I'm gonna call uh, the phase variable theta. Um, theta is cyclic. So with this, we get, you know, theta dot is omega. The x dot part now depends on f of x and not t. You know, t, t is special because what is x dot? That's dx dt. T is supposed to be the independent variable. If we have a, an ODE that depends on the independent variable, that is called um, an, a non-autonomous system and they are harder to analyze than autonomous system. So non-autonomous system means that in the right-hand side, you have the independent variable. If you want to think of it that way. They are harder to analyze. So now that we've defined this phase variable, we have x dot is a function of x and theta. Theta is just an added on uh, phase space variable, theta dot equals omega. The right-hand side is not a function of time anymore. Great. Right-hand side, no longer a function of the independent variable time. And we were only able to do that because the because of the, the periodicity. So all you care about is the phase of what was time. Theta is cyclic. So that means it lives on, it's a member of S1. So our extended phase space is x and then we add on one variable theta so this is n plus one dimensional and this is lives in rn cross s1 and the key thing yeah is that now because the right hand side is not a function of the independent variable we have an autonomous system autonomous system of ODEs. This is not to be confused with like autonomy as understood in terms of robotics, things that work on their own. This is a classification of ODEs. Okay. So now we have an N plus one dimensional autonomous system. We went from an N dimensional non-autonomous system. You actually do gain quite a bit in going to an autonomous system because it means the trajectories can't intersect each other. And that's a big improvement. Um, also, one of our phase space variables is periodic. It's not infinite in both directions, it's a circle. So that is, all of this is great news from a dimensional counting point of view. And uh, I know I've drawn this before, but I'm just drawing it again. So now if we've got this point X, and it's in this kind of Rn slice. Um, now time is a cyclic variable. So you can identify theta equals zero and theta equals two pi. And things will go from here to you know, mapping somewhere else. So we call this P of X, just like before. So we, we can analyze by means of a Poincaré surface of section. Sometimes people just call these SOS, but that has other meanings in other contexts. Uh, let's call this theta naught. So this, section of Rn is sometimes written as sigma theta naught. So sigma theta naught mathematically is all of the x's and thetas such that theta equals theta naught. So we could let, you know, let's say we wanted to look at, we could kind of say, let theta naught scan across a bunch of different values if, if we want. 
the Poincaré map. I wrote it that way as just P, but I should maybe write it as P sub theta naught. So there's a whole one parameter family of these maps where the parameter is theta naught and it maps things from the Poincaré section to itself. So this is also sigma theta naught because it's just shifted. This, this is, uh, maybe I should write this not as uh, 2 pi, but it's theta naught plus 2 pi. Doesn't really matter where we started, so we don't have to think of it as going from 0 to 2 pi. We could think of it as any theta naught, theta naught plus 2 pi. <clears throat> so this is, this is a map. It takes in points x on the Poincaré surface of section and maps them to a point P, theta naught x. And this is just, colloquially, this is just where x goes after one period t. And then, okay, it start, it's down here. If it's down here, then I just sort of go, okay, this is where it is, and then where does that go? It evolves and does things, I don't know what. Okay, so this is something you could use to analyze your favorite time periodic n-dimensional non-autonomous non-linear ODE. So let's use it to analyze one particular non-autonomous blah, blah, blah. Um, the duffing system. And now I'm gonna shift from the duffing system with a stable origin to the duffing system with an unstable origin. So I think I had a movie somewhere and I like to look at it because, uh, boy, we put a lot of the time into getting that to work. Um, right here. Yeah. Yeah, this was the table. Uh, actually, uh, it's a, a shaker system. So the ball moving on, on this track. The origin is that bump in the middle. So because the bump, it's unstable for that marble. We're looking at the dynamics of the marble. So this thing definitely has a finite Q. We didn't get rid of friction and we're forcing it. So what if after every period we analyze the motion of that? We could do it in this nice geometric uh, setting. So that's what we'll do. So we'll apply this approach to uh, the duffing. There, there is some ambiguity. So I like to say it's the duffing equation with an unstable uh, middle equilibrium point. So this is, I think before we wrote it in terms of um, we've written things in terms of Q's. Now I'll just write in terms of X. So X double dot. Um, before we had plus uh, X plus epsilon X cubed. And th there was also the damping term plus, you know, X dot over capital Q equals the forcing. Um, cosine omega t, okay. If we switch this, so this part, this is the, this has a stable origin. And then minus is unstable origin. So this thing could be, let me just specify, it could be plus or minus, plus or minus. So we're gonna study the one with the unstable origin. And I'm also going to write this differently. I just, I wanna get X double dot by itself. So X double dot by itself, and I'm choosing the unstable origin case, this becomes, um, I'm gonna modify so that now I've got X double dot equals X, okay. Um, minus, and I'm, I'm basically choosing this epsilon thing to be one. 
I'm going to call this x cubed. And then I'm going to write the damping term this way. I'm trying to follow uh, a book. And then instead of writing f naught, I'm writing f naught as epsilon. So epsilon changes. Okay. So that's our ODE. We've got our damping. Um, so delta equals one over Q. We're letting, we're forcing this thing to be one and we're just writing, because the forcing is gonna be a small parameter. Yeah, that's why we're calling it epsilon. So we've got the kind of, um, I guess you could call this the Hamiltonian part. This part comes definitely from Hamiltonian. We've got the part that's got damping and then we've got the forcing. So think of, it is probably good to think of that track, the ball moving on a track somewhere in Norris Hall and doing a bunch of stuff. And we shake this back and forth according to cosine omega t, shaking. Um, mathematically, you know, we're not gonna have, we require that damping, this damping parameter delta be something that's greater than or equal to zero. Delta equals zero, we've got a no damping. And then forcing epsilon greater than or equal to zero. Everything's non-dimensionalized. This is a this is in the form of a second order non-autonomous ODE. We're going to turn it into a first order autonomous ODE by first introducing variable y, which is just x dot, and then variable theta, which is omega t, which just comes from looking at the periodic part. Um, What's it a function of? When we do that, then we get this first order ODE, x dot equals y, y dot equals x minus x cubed minus delta y plus epsilon cosine theta, and then theta dot uh, equals omega. So now we've got a 3D first order, it's still nonlinear. You got some nonlinear terms, x cubed, nonlinear, but it's autonomous. ODE. So that's nice. And this looks a lot like uh, I had a paper by someone named Moon and Holmes in 1979. Um, but also I put in a, um, a chapter by Wiggins, it says chapter 10, and it's on, he might have it in his Poincare maps. I, I, don't, I don't know, it's called chapter 10. Just to make life easier, I'm gonna say that omega equals one, because that'll fix things for me. So, this is a lot like uh, the setup for that homework problem um, one, where numerically, if you just simulated with some initial condition, I think you're told like, use the origin or something. Um, so here's your X naught, Y naught. And then if you were to simulate what it does, it you know intersects itself and I don't know, it does a bunch of stuff. It keeps intersecting itself. But that's only if you were, you're looking at just a 2D projection of what is truly a 3D um, phase space. So up in the 3D phase space, the trajectory does not intersect itself. You got this theta parameter, oops, and this is X and Y. So your initial condition, whatever it is, it's kind of going through here and it does not ever intersect itself. So 
So the lines do not intersect. They can't intersect. If they intersected, it would mean it's the exact same state and they would have the exact same evolution, in which case it would be the same line. That's called uniqueness. So the lines do not intersect. Whereas here, you've got all these intersections, like, okay, if I'm at that point, I don't know which way it's gonna go. Go one of two ways, or this point, or I don't know, lots of things can happen. All right, so um, your homework problem one, if you've done it, you should get something like that. So this is appropriately modifying, not for the duffing system, which you're given, but for the, the role system. Um, and then you kind of have to, if you're trying to get an idea of the lay of the land, as I put it, you look at the case of no damping and let's look at just a little bit of forcing, 0 0.1. And then an initial grid of say, I don't know. I don't even know what I said. Initial grid of 40 points. You just, you pick, some points that are easy to specify in MATLAB, and then you follow them forward for a long time. See what they do. So that would be your initial grid. And then if you iterate it a hundred times, let's say, iterating, I use the term iterating for following each point under the map once. So iterate each point, say 200 times. So iterating onto the Poincaré map just means solving your ODE for a time t for each of these initial conditions, but then you keep following it and following it. So 200 times or so and keep the plot of points. And you'll get something like what I've uh, provided elsewhere in notes. Where is it? This uh, Duffing Poincaré Map MATLAB. So if you haven't started, you should look at that. Um, yeah, this is the system studied by Holmes and Moon. Since it was a flexible beam, they called it the Moon Beam. Kind of funny. Uh, this is what you would get after you follow a grid of points. Not the red and blue, just the background dots. So this started from just a regular grid of points. And then that initial condition, I don't know, it was 20 or so initial conditions were followed 200 times and you get a plot like this. So you'll get a similar looking plot for your system. Um, okay. Uh, maybe I should just insert that figure because I like it. So we see from this, what? The lay of the land. There are regions of tori, KAM tori, and then a chaotic sea. It sort of suggests, it, I think it means, because we do see that, that one could write the Hamiltonian for this problem as a unperturbed part that just depends on an action plus epsilon, a perturbed part that depends on an action and an angle. If we just have this, just this part means no chaos. This part, could be chaos, could bring chaos. And because we visibly see chaos, it's like, well, totally there's chaos. There's other things going on here too. Um, and that's the reason I had you plot those stable and unstable manifolds 
So if we do identify, I think I called it, uh, maybe this is a point P. There's got to be some point P that is an equilibrium. It, well, it's actually not an equilibrium. I shouldn't call it that. The point P is a, a fixed point of the map. And I guess I should say it is probably not an equilibrium. An equilibrium point means that a point where if you start there, then throughout time, you stay there. So let me uh, just kind of plot it this way. If we had epsilon equals zero and delta equals zero, so no damping, no forcing, at least for this duffing system, there is a point and it's the uh, origin actually, um, which is a, it's an unstable point. Let's call it P naught. And it, it's an unstable equilibrium, meaning if you start there, you just stay there, nothing happens. So P naught is uh, an unstable equilibrium point. It's kind of, you know, what do we mean a time T map? We've, we've turned off the forcing, we could still look at the system at every period. So P naught is an unstable equilibrium point and a fixed point of the Poincaré map. And it's an unstable fixed point. If you start a little bit away from it, you will keep going away. So that's what epsilon equals zero. If we have delta equals zero, epsilon, uh, maybe I'll, I'll do it on the same thing, but with a slightly different color. So delta is zero, epsilon is non-zero, but still small. Then nearby, there's going to be a point, we'll call that P sub epsilon, and it could be, it might do weird things we don't really know, but it will come back to itself, P epsilon. So P epsilon is not an unstable, it's not an equilibrium point of any kind, but is a fixed point of the Poincaré map. And typically it's going to be within an order epsilon of your, the, we would say P zero is the unperturbed point. And then P epsilon is the perturbed point. So the distance between them is less than order epsilon. I'd love to give you a reference for that, but um, I don't have it with me. <laughs> and so it, it may seem odd, especially looking at that mechanism of the ball moving on the track but really it's, it's that there's a, the unstable periodic orbit related to that top point, the hilltop. Um, even though it's very hard to find that in initial condition, the global dynamics associated with that initial condition kind of control everything. They kind of organize all of the motions of the system. And that's why, um, uh, at least that's that's what we're going to explore probably until uh, the end of the course because it's related to chaos in Hamiltonian systems and um, 
things called uh, the topic called phase space transport and whatnot. Um, so some things that I need to get into to talk more about that uh, are how we analyze the uh, the stability of periodic orbits, or actually analyze the stability of any trajectories. So, so that's what I'm going to talk about now. Um, trajectories and their stability. But we particularly care about periodic orbits. You can get the stability of any trajectory. Stability as, I mean, uh, our intuition, hopefully at this point would be, stability means uh, how much are things approaching? And are there any directions where things are not approaching? And I'll start out looking at the uh, autonomous ODEs and solutions of autonomous ODEs, now that we have that language. So x dot equals f of x. This is autonomous. X is in R n. Okay, so if we have a solution of interest, maybe we'll call that the reference solution. And I'll write that as x bar t. We can determine the local stability of it. Some people throw in this word local dynamic stability. But to me, it's kind of redundant. I don't know what stability would mean if it's not dynamic. And kind of like what we did for uh, analyzing the stability of periodic orbits uh, for the duffing equation with the stable origin, we define, we could say that any solution equals the reference solution plus some displacement away from the reference solution, right? Reference solution. Displacement from reference solution. And we usually will assume that uh, y, the magnitude of y is small in some sense, because we're going to be doing a, a Taylor series expansion. So kind of like before, you remember where we got an ODE for that displacement chi? Now we're going to get an ODE for the displacement y. If you'd like to have a picture in mind, here is the, here's like a reference solution. And let's say at this point, um, we're, the solution that we're looking at is this red thing. So this is X of T without the bar and the displacement or the location um, is a vector from x bar to x, and we call that y. So this is at, at this particular point, um, x is x bar plus y. At some later point, maybe um, let's call this time t1, and then, I don't know, it, I mean, we might be back here, x, t1, and that means this vector y has changed. We want an equation for y, and if y is small, then, oops, and I should put a bar over this. If y is small, then we should be able to get some uh, linearized dynamics for y.
So how do we get that? Um, we'll plug x equals x bar plus y into the original ODE. This, this thing up here, I'm just boxing the original equations of motion, if you want. Um, and then Taylor expand. about the reference solution. Okay, so x dot equals f of x. Uh, x equals x bar plus y, so we could write this as f of x bar plus y. x dot could be also written as x bar dot plus y dot. Now, what do we do with f of x plus y. Now we do the Taylor series expansion. We could do Taylor's uh, expansion for this n-dimensional system. What we get is f x bar plus d f x bar times y plus, and we keep going. I'll just summarize that as these are terms of order y squared or higher. So those are the higher order terms. Um, X, uh, what, how does X bar evolve? X bar evolves according to X bar dot equals F X bar. X bar dot equals F X bar. So that drops out of the equation. And what we're left with is uh, an equation of motion for Y. Y dot equals D F x bar y um, that that'd be to leading order right what is this dfx bar that is the this dfx bar is the jacobian of the vector field f evaluated along the reference trajectory. And so it is a, we could also call that uh, a matrix A and it, it is time dependent. So this is a n by n time dependent matrix. So at its simplest, y dot is a t y. Got that for ODE. In the context of, you know, often the language of linear systems theory, linear control theory, people would call this an LTV. And if they just say that, you won't know what they're talking about. But this stands for linear time varying system. Okay. And we can we can write the solutions from some time t, write the solutions from an initial condition at t equals zero to some time later, t greater than zero. And it has a, uh, it looks quite nice. So for any system that looks like this, We haven't yet assumed that the reference trajectory is periodic because if it is, then if we look, uh, A is actually a periodic time dependent matrix and that, that might lead to something. But for now, we're just looking at the stability of any trajectory over some finite amount of time. Um, but what did I wanna say? Yeah, we can write the, the solution from, um, uh, an initial time t equals zero to a later time t greater than zero 
uh, the following way. Y at some time T is always going to be some matrix, we'll call that phi times what Y is initially. So this picture of the reference solution, and here is the, and let's call this time T equals zero. Here's Y of zero. And then where are we later? At this time T, this is some matrix, some N by N matrix times Y of zero. So it's like a, um, this is sometimes called the state transition matrix. All right, so that would give you an approximation of how your state evolved perturbed from the reference trajectory from time zero to time T. Um, it's, uh, it's N by N and let me say where you get phi, uh, phi is an N by N matrix, capital phi that you obtain by solving N squared or N times N. ODEs that can be written in matrix form. P dot equals a function of time phi. So you'll notice this equation. Um, the matrix A is there, just like in this equation. Matrix A is there. Oh, I guess it's we need to say what the initial condition is. It should be obvious. If I evolve for zero time, then phi is the identity matrix. So if the initial condition is uh, the n by n. So that's the n by n identity matrix. Meaning over zero time, nothing changes. Um, okay. I'll stop there 